Woo! Uh, it's free association. Post game Raptors game six. One of the craziest games in Raptors history. I, I quickly talked with a bunch of friends as soon as this thing, we're, we're trying to run this very quickly. It's JD Bunkus, it's Donovan Bennett. But all I feel is that this took years off my life and that someday I'm going to be in a doctor's office and the doctor's going to be like looking at some chart and be like, did you by chance watch Raptors Celtics game six in 2020? And he'll be like, well, yes, I did, doctor. He's like, mm, mm, you see this spot right here? That's that game. How, how are you feeling right now? I mean, I feel great. Uh, I just watched an exciting basketball game. My entire timeline was Raptors related outside of like Elliot Friedman hockey tweets. Uh, so it was a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, even like non Raptors reporters or non traditional basketball fans were tweeting about the game. Um, yeah, the, the, with, with the entire basketball and really sporting world watching paying attention like we're on the precipice of nfl but it hasn't started yet college football has started but like if a tree falls in a forest but no one's around to see it does it make a sound like everyone is concentrating on basketball right now mm -hmm. and i think the, the thing i am happiest about was that that entire sporting culture got to see what we see for in most years 82 games the level of grit intensity ingenuity stick to itiveness if that was a word um that this franchise and its leader kyle lowry um exhibit there are so many kyle lowry is a hall of famer tweets that yeah. weren't from people who live in canada that i was like yeah no matter the outcome um this is a good vibe so i'm, I'm happy it was a positive outcome because um your facial expression would be very different if, if, if somehow they would have lost. Uh, you could have seen my facial. I'm guessing you could guess my facial expression when Nick Nurse didn't let Kyle Lowry touch the ball in the final possession of the game. Uh, you can guess what it was when Fred Van Vliet didn't pass it over to Kyle. Uh, I think that's where we start in this game. And that's a great point by you, that the Raptors commanded the attention of the sporting world. And it, it really felt like this was everything. And I know Twitter can be an echo chamber at times, but... You saw Joel Embiid tweeting that Kyle Lowry doesn't get enough respect. You saw Terrence Ross tweeting, you know, that's my vet and, and heart of a champion, stuff like that with regards to Kyle Lowry. And DeMar DeRozan. I, oh, of course. DeMar. I see. I didn't even see all of the Kyle Lowry related tweets, but he was amazing in this game. I tweeted that I think that two of Kyle Lowry's Mount Rushmore games are now in this series. I would argue that game three, again, a must win game. You fall down three, nothing. The series is over. He puts up 31 points. He was absolutely spectacular in that one. Uh, he makes the pass that goes down in Raptors lore. So, or sorry, that's game four. Game three, he makes the uh, – game three, he oh, – all these games are running together now. Sorry, game three, game, he has the 31 game. points, and he knocks down that pass to OG and Obi. That goes on the Mount Rushmore of Kyle Lowry. This game again tonight where he puts together 33 points. He plays the entire final frame of overtime with five fouls, doesn't do anything stupid, gets a strip that is probably going to be a little lost in this game that really tilted the overtime period, knocks down what is the game icing, game winning shot. And the point you made is, is so right that everyone getting to appreciate Kyle Lowry, this felt like the first time where the entire sporting world was just, this is Kyle Lowry loving night. This night was about Kyle Lowry. It was, the fan base has had many opportunities to celebrate him. But there has not been one singular moment that I can remember where everyone was in on Kyle Lowry, where everyone said, wow, finally, Kyle Lowry. Even game six against the Warriors, which I would put in his pantheon of his top four. I have Sixers game seven in 2016. I have Warriors game six. And then I have these two games against the Boston Celtics as, as my Mount Rushmore of Kyle Lowry games. And it just, not to be overly emotional because I want to get into the things that made him special in this game and actually break it down, but there was something really satisfying as someone who has observed the Raptors for a long time and who has gotten into multiple debates with people about why Lowry is beyond just, you know, a 17 and six guy for the Toronto Raptors. You know, that's what his career numbers are here and what he actually means to this franchise and to move finally, just closing the door on all of the things that plagued him in the past. And now it's just, it's definitive. The basketball world knows it that Kyle Lowry's import to the Toronto Raptors it, it can't be quantified. It extends beyond a box score. And some nights, like, it, it can also be quantified by both. Yeah, 35 points in a closeout game. Second time in his career he's done that. He's only behind Kawhi and Vince for more points in a closeout game 
in franchise history. But his best play of the night was not a point, was not a rebound, was not a, a steal or assist. His best play of the night was calling timeout. Calling timeout yeah. before his feet had hit the ground. And that, yeah. like, is not going to make highlight packs tonight. But that's quintessential Kyle Lowry. When you need a play in a meaningful moment, he might do it with his skill. He might do it with his will and grit. Um, or he might do it with his head and his brains. And that was the case in, in that circumstance. So uh, I've said it a couple times throughout this playoff run. I say it again tonight. Give Kyle Lowry his flowers while he's around to see them and smell them. This was his night uh, tonight. Uh, it, 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 was, it was also um, a big night for Norman yeah. Bartholomew Powell. Playoff yeah. Powell showed up in a big way. 23 points, 15 in overtime, 6 of 11 from the field, 3 of 6 from 3. And I love that even when stuff wasn't going down from early, he stayed aggressive. He scored more than half of the Raptors' points in overtime when they really, really needed to match Boston, who executed some beautiful offense. And, and uh, we were wondering, you know, when we were going to get that playoff Powell game. And he, he, he really couldn't have saved it for a better time because if he didn't have it tonight, the season would have been over. Man, you, you and I talked about it a lot coming into the series that the Raptors were going to need to have the best six or seven players that it's, it's very clear that Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Kemba Walker, they represent the easiest offense in this series. And the way that Pascal Siakam has played specifically, which another really tough night for him, like some bad decision-making, some really tough shots, some feeling of just the guy was cursed with the ball rolling out of the rim even when he does make a good attack in overtime – but they just needed to have those depth pieces. And, you know, this game feels like it was a million years long. Like, again, it, it, it felt like a journey. We all took this journey together. It was like a, we watched a trilogy. We just sat through all of the Godfather movies. But you're right. Norm was amazing. And there was a moment in this game, like when he first start, when he got his first minutes, I thought he looked lost still. I thought that he looked disengaged and he just couldn't find a way into the game. He's just kind of standing off into the corner. He wasn't really doing much. He wasn't making an impact. And I thought there was a good reason why Nick Nurse finally went to Matt Thomas. He said, I need a guy who's going to be able to do something. And there was a little moment there where the game's hanging in the balance. And it's actually, again, another really kind of pivotal moment of the game where the Raptors are down 11. They call a timeout. They go on a run. They get back in the ball game. It's another moment for Kyle Lowry amongst his many in this game. But Norm did not look like Norm. And... In the past, we have seen Powell get benched. We have seen Nurse not go back to him in some of these spots. In this one, Nurse went with his horses. He went with his best seven guys. He said, I trust you. I'm going to keep putting you back into the series. The small ball was working. We need your offense. We need your creativity. And Powell kept doing it. He kept providing it. And that Marcus Smart three in overtime with about a minute 20 left in the corner, I thought, you know, that's game over. And then here comes Norm Powell with just a monster clutch three, another one. And then the strip and gets down the floor and gets the N1. And I, like, it feels like this guy only has that in the playoffs. It's either playoff pal to the max where you're just getting everything from him in a moment or you're getting absolutely nothing. And yeah, thank God that he showed up in this one because you're right. Without Powell breaking down their defense, without his secondary scoring to supplement what they were missing from Siakam and what they were frankly missing from Fred Van Vliet for large stretches of this game, they don't get it done. Like, it goes Lowry by far as the number one most important player, Powell number two, and then it's basically picking through what you think the moments were from other guys, probably OG and then, you know, Serge Gasol combo and, and th like, phenomenal. Phenomenal performance by Norm Powell. Stayed confident, a guy who struggled with it, came up in a big moment, finally broke through, and a lot of kudos to Nick Nurse for sticking with him and, and not abandoning it, which I think would have been kind of fair at, at some point in this game. Yeah, I, I, I think Serge played well, um, you know, uh, uh, off the bench. One, the fact that he was even playing, considering he was in a walking boot yesterday, uh, respect to him. And when the offense was really struggling and, and it looked like Boston was going to extend the lead and run away with it, he hit a couple clutch threes that kept him within, uh, you know, striking distance and kept the game competitive early. Uh, Boston started to really try and expose him in the pick and roll and get Kemba going downhill. And they started those picks almost at half, almost at the center circle and giving Kemba a long runway, which was difficult. 
Um, but, but I thought Serge played well. But, but speaking of the pick and roll, I actually think, you know, that other guy, right, if we're talking about three stars, you're going to go hockey night style, as big as Serge was, I think that other guy probably has to be OG. And I loved – we talk about Norm's big three. Uh, OG had a big three uh, to answer a, a, a big bucket from, from Boston to, to keep things interesting in OT. But OG had some great defensive possessions on Kemba, specifically uh, in a switch. He also had some great defensive possessions – against Daniel Tice like he literally we talk about this guy can guard one to five right like oh Kevin Garnett and his prime can guard one to five OG literally guarded the one and the five at a high level today and yes I know they're playing super small and and Tice was in the dunker spot and got a lot of easy looks either at the rim or just bounce passes with one step and, and finish but I do think that OG can play Tice well because you're trading twos for threes on the other end. And if OG is going to continue to make threes, you're going to take that bet. But, but also, in terms of rebounding, I mean, Tice is yes. taller than OG, but OG is stronger than Tice. And he's doing a good job of if he's not going to secure the rebound himself another night with double-digit rebounds. He's keeping Tice occupied and off the glass so that Norm and Fred can come in and scoop uh, those, those long rebounds and they can get out in transition. Yeah, I want to I talk about that specifically with OG because you're right. I think that the hockey night in Canada, three stars go Lowry won by a million miles, then Norm Powell breaking out, being playoff Powell, but then OG and Anobi. When Kawhi Leonard left, you and I had conversations about how they were going to miss certain things from him that – are not as obvious, right? Like, clearly they need Kawhi Leonard scoring at the end of the game. Clearly it's been missed in this series, but Marcus Gasol has had struggles rebounding the ball. That's been very apparent in the series. He doesn't have the same lift, and when he's been occupying Tice, it's so that the guards can fly in and pick up the rebounds. OG Ananobi's been able to do both. When he's on Tice, he's able to box him out and then use his athletic ability to separate from him and then also go up and grab the rebound. And the thing I mentioned about Kawhi Leonard when he left that the Raptors were really going to miss is the clutch rebounds. How many times in the postseason last year, Kawhi Leonard came up and was the team's best rebounder as well. And what an integral part that is in defense. And I was talking to, who was it today? I, I was talking to someone on Good Show this afternoon. I, I apologize for getting, for, oh, it was Kevin Arnovitz from ESPN about OG and what a fan he is and why he voted for him for second all NBA. And he thought, you know, if this guy can become a, a poor man's Kawhi Leonard, that, that is still on the table for him. That is something that he can accomplish and that we, when we were gushing about the player. And we'll talk about OG long term, some other podcast one night. But for this night, this evening, OG Ananobi's rebounding was huge. It's totally one of the underlying stories of the game that is going to be like probably not as discussed because of Powell scoring and Lowry scoring and gutting out the 50 plus minutes in this ball game and Marcus Saul coming out of the tunnel and uh, drinking the Michael secret stuff and all of a sudden showing up as uh, old Marcus all and giving you some moments, Serge Ibaka's clutchness. It reminded me of game seven against the Sixers where he's just not afraid of those moments. And when he needed some secondary scoring, he comes up for you, but OG Ananobi's rebounding was spectacular in that game. And yeah. it was really one of the most pivotal uh, attributes that the Raptors had. Yeah. It gives you a double, double 13 points, 13 rebounds. More importantly, he holds Tice to, to seven rebounds. And Tice played the majority of the game. The game went into double overtime, and he had seven rebounds. And to your point with, about Gasol struggling rebounding the ball, Gasol had two rebounds. Right? Yeah. So he's not necessarily being a factor in the paint defensively, helping you close possessions. How are we with Gasol? He plays 16 minutes tonight, obviously struggles, doesn't, at points, doesn't close the game as they went small. Uh, we, in our last pod, we s s disagreed in terms of mm -hmm. how much of the blame is at his feet. He did hit two threes, which is a great sign. Um, he also, you know, showed visibly uh, some frustration. And I, I think for the first time, I, I think I saw some opportunities where he was just wide open off the pick and roll or, or dunking into the paint in the middle and guys weren't looking for him in the sense that not only, not only maybe is he not trusting his shot, his teammates weren't necessarily trusting him as much early in the first half. Where are you in terms of the cost benefit 
of the intangibles that he brings, but also, you know, at this point of his career, you know, the lack of athleticism. So I think that the shooting problems is like they were in his head. He knew those same statistics. He's a basketball genius. He's got a supercomputer in his brain. He knows exactly that he is struggling shooting. And you saw how frustrated he was when he left the floor in the first half and just, you know, couldn't even hit a layup, missed a layup, just looked completely broken. I think Gasol does a lot of things that get missed every single night defensively and with his passing. There's not very many bigs that see the floor the way he does, that set screens the way he does. But when he can't roll and when he can't jump and when he's not giving you rebounding, it becomes a tougher proposition to play him multiple minutes. And especially since, like, he was lumbering at times, especially in game five. I think that that was a bit of a breakthrough for him, just in terms of it wasn't only that he knocked down some threes, right? He showed some confidence and he shot a baseline shot. He had a huge block on Jason Tatum. Again, the defense is always understated. He has a beautiful tip when they're trying to get the ball into Tice. He's great at recovering and taking away the bottom of the rim when they give that ball to guys. Like you saw the way they were exploiting the Raptors in overtime with Tice on those rim rolls. And when Gasol is there, he's usually able to recover and take away the basket. I think that that is kind of, this is going to be the interesting thing going into the next game is you're still starting Gasol. You're still giving him his third quarter burn. But I think the Raptors go back to this look. Like, I think that they go back to the small ball to close this game if it's tight. It just, it allows them, I, I just think that they hung with the Celtics. Like, there were multiple moments where the Raptors were small and it worked. They got back into this game because the Raptors went small. They, they were down 11. They get back to this game. The Raptors go small. It works out for them. They close this game. The Raptors go small. And Siakam was really struggling. And I thought maybe there was a moment where you'd look at Serge Ibaka and see if he could give you something else because he was just, you know, so dreadful offensively, the turnover. But some of that's just frustration as the viewer. So I, I think that Gasol's minutes, like the outline from this game was what you're going to ask of him in the next one, which is good minutes to start the first and second half and I don't think you're closing with him anymore. I think you're closing small ball. Are, are, are you closing small ball too? Like, do you think that we saw the Raptors unlock something tonight that, that they carry over into the game seven, which is Siakam at the five, OG, Norm Powell, Fred Van Vliet, and Kyle Lowry? Uh, I, would like, I would love to see that close. I, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed um, to seeing Ibaka close as well. I, I, but then the question is, who are you taking off the floor? Norm is your second best player. You're certainly not taking off... Uh, OG off the floor. Are you, are you taking Pascal Siakam off the floor? I mean, he hasn't certainly so. played in a way that, that uh, earns a, a definite rotation spot, but he's still, you know, an all-star. And th- to be fair, he, he did play some very good de- defense he against did. Jason Tatum. He, he always does. He always plays great defense. Like, it, 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 it gets masked a little bit because his offense has been struggling so much. But you're right. He's playing Tatum, and he's got the length, and he's got the speed and the quickness to keep up with him. Like, you love having him on the floor in those spots to get stops. Sorry. I think the, no, no, it's okay. I think the bigger question for me is not even the close, but the finish. Like the Raptors routinely have struggled in first quarters and, and we are focusing on this game because this is the most recent one, but if we, and, and, I, and no one really wants to talk about it or think about it at this point, but if we fast, if we rewind back to game five, which was just abysmal, they lost that game in the, in the first quarter and really the first half. They, it, first, it, the first 18 possessions, they were 2 of 15 from the floor. They spotted Boston a bunch of points because of empty possessions. They were down 27 at halftime. And, and basically, after that, they, they won the game by five. Now, some of that was garbage time. I understand that. But they were much better. The, the game was just over early. And, and my concern in an elimination game, when you struggle to start games offensively, is – can you roll the dice and hope that the offense in the half court is a little bit better and, and Marcus Sol is confident shooting? Because one thing Serge has shown is that whether he's got two feet or one feet or he's played two minutes or 20, he's coming off the bench and he's looking for his shot. Um, and he's, he's been shooting the three confidently. He's, he's been the best three point shooter for the team in a series outside of Kyle Lowry. And so I, I'm actually more concerned about how they're starting games necessarily than how they finish. Cause if, if they're in the game at the end, They've shown that they've got ways to figure out how to win them, even when it looks unpredictable at times. Yeah, I think that you, again, your advantages are that you have the best seven players in the series. And so I don't think that you're taking out one of your players. Like, I don't think that you're going to just go into a game and not have Gasol because you, you saw what he can provide you. I just think that the hook is earlier, that it's exactly the way that it was in this game where if But, but he here's a question it, for you, though. Here's a question. Too, and I, lo- I love the, your best seven 
players in the series because we're playing seven aside right now, right? right? Like this is rec league. You got two subs. Um, we're, so it's 14 players. Of those 14, who, who has played in 14th place? Who's been the worst of the seven aside? It's been Gasol. Like he's been the worst guy that is a high rotation player who's played in the series. So the question is, do you want to start? You, don't, you, don't, you disagree? No, I don't, I don't know. Who's been, Who's, who's been the worst? Siakam. In this, well, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Fred, too, because it's just, it's, it's the you think You think Siakam and Fred have been worse than Marcus Gasol? Well, here's the thing is that I don't think that you need as much from Marcus Gasol. Like, he's your center that you're asking, like, you're asking Gasol to play 20 He's minutes being paid $25.5 million. Yeah, I, want, yeah. I mean, I want, I want, I want, I want something. But if we're talking about like guys who make it's like I don't think the contract is really relevant here. He's a guy that's at the end of his career. He's he's really struggled in some games. But I just I think that the most important pieces on the team are Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Vliet, and Pascal Siakam. And Fred's had some moments, and Fred's knocked down some shots, but he's really struggled at times in the series. And defense has been good as always, and so is Siakam. Defense has been good, but offense has been worse than Fred's, but far more inconsistent and just hasn't been there. So I'm just. I, I don't know. I guess it, defi- it depends how you like define worst. It's like, has Gasol had the impact of those guys? No, because he doesn't play. He doesn't have the import of those guys. Like I view it as like the Raptors big three. And one of their big three has been abysmal again, had another night where he's five of 20 and has turnovers in overtime and just kind of brain cramp moments where he's on Brad Wanamaker and he's not taking him into the paint and he scores on uh, Grant Williams going to the paint. And then the next possession settles for a bad three point shot. Like, Again, like if I think if you're asking me who I think is the better player, it's Pascal Siakam in the series. But if you're asking me like what the Raptors' biggest problem is, I don't think it's Marcus Gasol. I, I certainly have thought it's it's Siakam's offense. Um, I I want to ask you, uh, I want to get back to the Lowry thing. Like unless there's something else you want to do on this game, because like I said, I think that the close small ball. I think that you start that way. I think you pull Marcus Gasol very quickly if he doesn't have it for you, just like you did in that night. You go to surge, you do all those things. Just you're basically going for the same template. There were moments where the offense, even small, did stick. Like, I don't want to make it all completely hunky-dory. Like, the last four minutes of the fourth quarter, they didn't score a field goal. It didn't work out. I was kind of surprised they stuck with it. The end of overtime, same thing, where they can't get a basket. Fred Van Vliet decides not to give it to Kyle Lowry, makes a mistake. Norm Powell gets the final possession. Kind of a weird moment for Nurse, one that I think he gets away with and probably is the big story if the Raptors lose that game. 18 seconds left. You don't let Lowry decide. But... Do you agree with me that this was one of Kyle Lowry's four best games? Like, do, what do you think his Mount Rushmore is? I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think his best four games. Like, what, what one am I missing? What's the one that you think is more debatable that, that you would put on there? Because I, I think it is those four. Like, do you agree that it's two from this series? Game seven against Miami and then game six against uh, the Golden State Warriors in the finals. And then the two from this series. Yes. Yeah, those are, those are the games. Yeah, those are, yeah. Those are the games. Yeah. It's crazy that he's had like two of his definitive games at his age, what, 34, like his age 34 seasons, that this is where he's gotten to and that you would think like the diminished athleticism. What do you, what's the most surprising part of this to you with Lauer? Because like, again, 50 minutes and that he doesn't get tired to me and take a stupid foul at the end of the game and he's such a gamer and he stays on the floor for that final frame. Like that was what I think was most impressive to me in that in, it was more than the shot making. It's just... The, the ability to stay sharp despite what had to be such little oxygen in his brain from the amount of minutes that he's played over the last week and a half. Yeah, I mean, our listeners don't have to scroll too far on their favorite podcast app to go to an episode, episode where we talked about what his availability is going to be like because he was the person with the ankle sprain, right? Like, we're talking about surge now. It wasn't that long ago coming into this series that we were worried about Lowry's health, and health has always been an issue with, with Lowry at this time of year. So I, I think that's the biggest thing. And coming out of game one, I, I, I felt like he didn't look right necessarily. And now he looks more than right. He looks yeah. like one of the best players in the world. And, and, and certainly I, you talked about, you know, talking to some friends uh, about the game. I had a, you know, a text group with a bunch of buddies. And the only thing I wrote in the group was, Kyle Lowry needs to take every shot. And obviously that didn't happen. But the point being, if you're going to trust anyone in this moment, 
no disrespect to OG, who's hit big shots, and I loved the out of bounds play with him at the rim that, that, that should have been shooting, but oh well. Oh, another moment that, again, so many moments from this game. Like, it was hard to categorize them all and like catalog them all. Yeah. Uh, um, and of course, Jalen Brown gets a, a similar foul going the other way. They, they would have been shooting anyways because of the foul situation, but it just hurt to watch. Um, you know, no disrespect to Norm, who I love the fact that Nurse has confidence in him. We've seen that play at the end of games before. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen it really work, but we, we've seen it. Um, but but I, I, I just want the ball in Lowry's hands to, for either him to take a shot or him to decide who is going to take a shot. Um, like, he is literally the security blanket for this team. He's their level of insurance. And so, yeah, I, I think this is uh, right up there with, with one of his – best performances and in, in, in the bubble we have these moments where again we talked about it to start so it makes sense we'll talk about this to end where NBA Twitter is going nuts right Luca mania for a bit Devin Booker just ice cold from three Dame like from the logo Jamal Murray like just transcending the way we view him Kyle Lowry had one of those nights and yeah he scored 35 but it wasn't because he was getting bucket after bucket after bucket. He was making heady play after heady play after heady play. Yeah. And, and, and if anything, like that should be the takeaway of him in this game, of, of his career and, and why. Um, like he literally is a champion, no matter what happens in game seven or the rest of the way. Like he competed at a level worthy of uh, winning a championship. I think that this has actually done a lot for his Hall of Fame candidacy. People outside of Toronto do not view him. I would say the majority of them do not view him as a Hall of Famer because of the raw numbers. And because of where they, a lot of people stack him in terms of his generation of point guards, right? Like it, he's a tough guy to rank. I think Raptors fans sometimes put him a little too high and that the U.S. media sometimes puts him a little too low. But it's clearly been a conversation inside of the bubble. It was written by Chris Mannix and Sam Amick about how after the game three, it was a big discussion point talking about whether Kyle Lowry is a Hall of Famer. You saw it a lot on Twitter tonight. But I, I do have a bit of a theory with Kyle in terms of why this is even more meaningful is that I think in the bubble, it, it's harder for guys to get up for these moments and these big games at times. That you can see some teams run a little flat. You can see some games run a little flat. And that without the atmosphere of the fans, there's almost an added value in the guys who have the – ultimate give a crap meter you know that that never take a play off that play hard the entire game and are always intense and that raise the level of their teammates and having a guy like Kyle Lowry a leader a leader like Kyle Lowry who's always bringing that intensity who doesn't he's never able to take the, the pedal off the gas or the foot off the gas pedal and just drives your team in that way I, I think it sets a tone for the entire group I think it's a confidence that the group has in him and it's a big part of the reason I just I how are you feeling about game seven? This is how we'll wrap up just in terms of like, I think we're both going to pick the Raptors as a Raptors Homer podcast. And I don't want to live in a reality where it's the other way around. They avoid heartbreak. There's like this weird thing about this team where just, they, they always surprise you. They always come up with a way to not disappoint you. And it was this way again, but I just, I, I have faith in Kyle Lowry showing up in that game seven more than I do of any other player in the series. Like if you had to ask me, who's definitely going to have a good game seven. I would pick Lowry first. No question. And Van Vliet said it after game three that they done effed up by letting the Raptors back in the series. And in a way, um, you know, they had the Raptors up against the ropes on the mat in game six. And uh, I, even when, you know, they had a chance to close it out when they stopped the Raptors from scoring at the end of the fourth quarter for the last four minutes, 23 seconds. And, they let it get to overtime and a second overtime. And, you know, I think they done effed up. Uh, so I would, I would pick the Raptors in game seven. Yes, I would say Lowry um, is the, the guy who I would bet has a good game, certainly. Yeah, but, series consistently. But no question. Uh, I mean, you can make an argument like he's outside of Jimmy Butler. He's probably the best player in the round. Right, like LeBron well, is LeBron. <laughs> like I said, you saw LeBron. Yeah, LeBron, I mean LeBron. LeBron's LeBron, pretty good. LeBron, yeah, LeBron's no, it's just true. Good. It's true. LeBron has had some crazy blocks, but um, Kyle Lowry's been been on a mission. 
It's the old guys. The old guys are doing it. Jimmy Butler, yeah, LeBron James, Kyle Lowry. Like the bubble is for the olds. It's like move over youth. You know, I talk about this sometimes that sports fans are now like time travelers, right? Like, and we're guilty of this too. We do this all the time. It's part of the fun, but we have, um, we can never really live in the moment. You know, everything is always through the lens of, well, what's someone's salary going to be down the line? And what have they done in the past? And, you know, what's the team going to look like in two years? We're just these sports fans who, I don't want to say we're smarter, but we just have more information and we're always thinking more about this stuff. And that's why media works now. Who's going to be the next future team? There was so much about what the team is going to look like post Kyle and what the team is going to look like next year and whether it's Siakam's team and whether Fred Van Vliet is going to be kind of supplanting him as the second most important point guard and the Brooklyn series, the way that Fred was playing in the bubble and just watching this, it's like, one, it's still Lowry's team. And two, let's just all live in the moment with Kyle Lowry right now because this is the best that we've ever seen him. I think it's arguably the best we're ever going to see him. And it's just, it's very, very fun to watch the, the face of the franchise, the greatest Raptor of all time, the guy who will have his jersey retired, like all these Vince Carter commercials that are running during these games. I'm like, what are we going to run for Kyle Lowry when he retires? Like, is it just going to be like wall to wall commercials the entire time? Like, what, what's it going to be? Just it's gonna be charges. Flying? Yeah. Same thing, charges. <laughs> yeah, charges, just charge after charge in the commercial packet. I'm just saying that the difference in terms of his importance at this point and the way that he's loved is, is wild. I actually asked that question on Twitter. Um, I'll close with that. Do you think Kyle Lowry is the most beloved Toronto sports athlete in your lifetime? Like I, I wasn't really old enough to experience the, the full Doug Gilmore or Wendell Clark thing. I know that that's who my like parents really love. I know that Vince had a moment, but I'm saying like the carryover because the exit matters now too. But do you think it's Kyle Lowry? Do you, th because if he's, you ran his approval rating right now across Canada, it's like, even if you're not a basketball fan, you love Kyle Lowry. What's not to like? I mean, Pinball Clemens is pretty beloved. I know. Pinball, um, I said, is if you did a per 36, like the people who know Pinball, it's like he would win because no one has ever – Pinball has made me cry twice. <laughs> like, really? Well, yes, twice. Uh, said speaking um, engagements. He's a powerful speaker. It's like he he's a very up, powerful man. speaker. Um, I, I don't – that would be interesting. Over, not to, to overanalyze this, but – over the course of his tenure in Toronto, probably, but the, the, the night of the bat flip, there, there was yeah. no more beloved Toronto athlete, I don't think, at any single moment, moment than Jose Batista. <laughs> and so, so I think he certainly would be up there. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I'll, 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 I'll say this. I think it's not just him and, and kind of what he's done, but how he's done it that makes yes. him beloved. Uh, Andre Iguodala was on plays. a, it was no question, uh, it, but, but also what he's kind of had to go through to get to the spot. Uh, Iguodala was on a podcast with Bill Simmons, and he's talking about like, you know, players who have to kind of go through the mud to get, you know, where they are and that, that, that matters. And he was referencing Jimmy Butler, and we've seen him in the bubble, right? He's, he's gone off because he's had some difficulty in different situations in his life. LeBron. You know, how many flame outs did LeBron have in the playoffs? He was criticized. He was a running joke. And he's had to go through that. And now he's flourishing in, in this moment in, in the bubble, in the playoffs. Kyle is the same way. Like, it was a running joke what his field goal percentage was in the playoffs with him and DeMar. Year in and year out, it, it was a thing where he had a fan base, his own, that doubted him. And he had American commentators that crushed him. He kind of had to go through that. And similar to, to the way Dirk did when he got through the other side, it's like, you can't tell me anything anymore. Like, I'm, I'm now established, and I am free in this moment. And I said when we had the debates, okay, well, who, who do you honor? Who, who is the Raptor on top of the Mount Rushmore? And there's certainly a camp that will forever say Vince Carter because the franchise may not be here. If, I don't if think it that camp him. exists anymore. I think it's vacant. I think there's like no one there. I think it's well, we'll camp. see. People yeah. will interact. People will people will interact with, but but I think it depends on your your age, and 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 where you were in life when Vince came up. I think there's there's a, a certain camp that said, well, listen, Kawhi Leonard brought us to a place that we've never been to. He delivered a championship. I, I was on I was on that camp before, but I, I'll say now like yes Kawhi delivered a championship, but what Lowry has delivered is culture, and 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 I don't think identity that that is less valuable. I think that's actually more difficult. And, and so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say at this point, given this run that he's done this year to back up what he did in winning a championship last year, the the guy's Lowry.
Yeah. I just think he represents the bleep you attitude of the of the fan base. I think he is just – he's a blue-collar guy that – we do that a little too much, like, for a metropolitan city like Toronto, but for a country like Canada where, like, everybody does – grow up like in this market too like it's always been the grinder player that gets beloved in either in in whatever sport right it's like they like the johnny or the the john mcdonald's almost said johnny mcdonald i guess the news is on my mind uh but they like the john mcdonald's they like the ty domies the wendell clarks uh they like the gritty players and kyle lowry fits all of that where it's like he's a star player who's a gritty player who's a blue collar guy and i just think he resonates with this place like very few do like very few ever will and yeah, I'm just so happy that he's having his moment and that we got to celebrate it and that the Raptors are alive and we get to watch one more Kyle Lowry game. Uh, we'll, we'll Kyle, Lowry's, Kyle Lowry's statue looks like what? Oh, what Kyle. kind of statue is he going to get? What, what pose is he doing? What, what are they going to capture to immortalize outside the front of that, that arena? There are some people that are going to be very concerned with the butt and how the butt looks in the statue. It's going to be, I bet you like that'll be the main <laughs> focal point of when he gets made. The butt needs to be included, like it needs to do it. Uh, unfortunately, you can't have, it'd be inter- like, again, you can't have him on his back taking a charge because it would get rid of the butt. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I think it's just Kyle Lowry smiling. Like maybe it's the hug and OG and an Obi. Maybe that's that would be it. great. You know, the big smile, you know, the bronze smile of, of Kyle Lowry being happy for one of his teammates. But no, I, I, I just think that uh, I, he will have one. Let's just put it that way. He will have he will have a statue in Toronto, and I bet you it's going to be sooner rather than later. I, I think it's him on the float with the with the aviators yeah. on, with the reflection of the entire yes. city the in the glasses, holding the the Larry O'B with the old school uh, wearing jersey. jersey. People are wearing... like, who is this? this is a great great grandson? Well, I think he's Stoudemire. I think that's who this is. <laughs> the first Raptors point guy. Yeah, yeah tough. I love it. Uh, so leave a review, subscribe. Uh, we're on Spotify. Follow on Spotify. Subscribe on iTunes. Leave a review. We always love when you do that. We're on uh, YouTube. So uh, if you're doing that, leave a thumbs up. Uh, leave a little comment. Tell us what we missed. Tell us what you can't wait for. Leave your Raptors prediction. Follow us on Twitter, at JD Bunkus, at Donovan Bennett. Follow us on Instagram, the exact same thing. We'll catch you after game seven. Game seven. Go Raps. <laughs>